us today in chapter 34 and begin reading there with verse number one. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Then the Lord told Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. I will write on them the same words that were on the tablets you smashed. Be ready in the morning to climb up Mount Sinai and present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. No one else may come with you. In fact, no one is to appear anywhere on the mountain. Do not even let the flocks or herds graze near the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two tablets of stone like the first ones. Early in the morning he climbed Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down on a cloud and stood there with him, and he called out his own name, Yahweh. And the Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. Moses immediately threw himself on the ground and worshiped. Then he said, O Lord, if it is true that I have found favor with you, then please travel with us. Yes, this is a stubborn and rebellious people, but please forgive our iniquity and our sins. Claim us as your own special possession. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy and absolutely perfect word. Last week, we talked a little bit about justice, and there's still a lot of misunderstandings in our world, I think, about justice. In fact, did you know that about two-thirds of Americans say that they agree with the statement that people are good and that pretty much almost everyone will go to heaven? They believe that there is a God, and that God is a God of acceptance and love. Whatever you do or believe, that's fine with God. You can come in. But the Bible doesn't really seem to support that idea at all. In fact, it says that all of us have sinned. All of us have done things that are wrong before a holy and perfect God and that there are consequences to our sins. That we need someone to save us from the consequences of those sins. In fact, Jesus said in the seventh chapter of Matthew in verse 13, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gates wide, for many will choose that way. I think it's because we have this idea of God. A lot of times we picture him as this old grandfather figure who just kind of wants to hand us something every uh, now and again. Doesn't really expect much of us. He's just kind of pleasant and smiles and doesn't offend anyone. He's just sort of harmless. That's our perception of God. Now, it's true. God is very kind and generous, but he is certainly infinitely powerful and just, and he is certainly have expectations for us in the way in which we should conduct ourselves. There is right and wrong in the world, and that God is always at work doing something. In fact, he's sustaining everything that is or ever will be. And so we go back to our passage and we look here and we see the interaction that Moses has with God. And the first thing that God does here is he identifies himself of who he is speaking. He refers to himself as Yahweh, which um, is the meaning of which is I am or I will be that which I will be. That God has always been and always will be before everything else and after everything else would be gone. God would remain. He was never created, just always is. He is the one who sustains and keeps everything in all of existence. And he identifies that he will not tolerate any rivals. He expects to be worshipped. There's nothing that no other person, no other thing, no other object, no other teaching, New Age thought or pagan philosophies or other religion or a sense that our world talks about spirituality is really tolerated to God. He himself expects to be worshipped. For he is a God of justice and a God of judgment. 
But right in the middle, as he's talking about these characteristics, he, he talks about his goodness and how our behaviors matter to him, that sin is, in fact, offensive to him. And because of our sin, we have offended God. And if we don't realize that we've never offended God, well, then we never think we did anything wrong. We don't understand that our sin is horrendous to God. And if we don't understand that, then why would we think we need God? He's just an option to make your life a little better. But you don't really need Him. But we do need Him. God is not some harmless old man that's just sitting there hoping we visit Him two or three times a year out of pity or guilt. And maybe He'll pat our heads and give us a little candy and say, be on your way, you little scamp. No. He expects to know us because He loves us. He, he is the one who gave us the opportunity to have life. He forgave us of the consequences of our sin. We owe Him everything. We don't respond to God out of, ah, it's a good little thing to give God some attention. Without God, you're going a path to eternal death, eternal separation from God. I've used this illustration before, but I think it makes the point, so allow me to use it again. If I were to give you a parachute and we're all on a plane and I said, here's this beautiful parachute, isn't it nice looking? Put it on. And you do and you start sitting down with the parachute because I say, yeah, good, huh? And you start thinking, boy, this thing's not that comfortable. It's kind of making my back hurt against the seat and you start looking around and you're like, hey, that guy over there doesn't have a parachute. Maybe I don't need this parachute. He seems to be doing pretty good without it. But what if I shared more information with you and I said, when I gave you the parachute, when I said, put it on, I said, uh, you know, in about 20 minutes, this plane's going to be out of fuel. It's going to trash. We, we need this parachute then and we're going to jump out and this parachute's going to save our lives. Well, then we think, oh, I guess this little minor discomfort on my back mm, doesn't really matter near as much, does it? In fact, you look around and you say, hey guys, without the parachute, you might want to consider putting on the parachute. That's like God. God isn't there to just make your life a little bit more comfortable. So you just feel good, just an option like a buffet and like, yeah, I'll have some of the general sows or I'll have some pineapple, whatever, you take what you want. No, God's a necessity because without him, you're going to die. And not just die in a physical sense, die eternal, separated from God. And when you realize that, you want to put on the parachute and you want other people to know God. That's what God is like. God is so good, but He also is just. And He judges sin. And He must punish sin. That's what the scripture tells the wages of sin is death. Eternal death and separation from God. And we don't like to think about that. It is unpleasant to think about things that are unpleasant. We like to try to ignore, get out of our minds, but they are true nevertheless. None of us like to think about our aging process, the breakdown of our bodies, the medical conditions are probably only going to get worse as we age. But in fact, they are a necessity of life. They, they warn us of the end of our lives that we may know that God is good and that he's calling us one time to be with him in his forever home. We have to deal with the violations of our transgressions against God. First John tells us in chapter 1, verse 8, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. If we say, hey, I never did anything wrong, I don't do anything wrong, God says, well, you're lying. You have. Because we're all rebels against God. Every one of us has rebelled against God. We're not perfect. We've been selfish and greedy. We've been proud. We've earned God's wrath because of this. Now, that doesn't sound good news, does it? Kind of sounds hopeless. We're all in this terrible boat, indirectly going towards death. But remember, God has given us that option to accept Him, that He Himself and His justice will pay for the consequences of our sin. He loves us that much. It tells us in our passage, He is slow to anger and righteous. And in fact, it tells us that for those who have um, yes, it says it's, you know, it talks about the three, the, the third and the fourth generation of he will, you know, punish or very concerned about the sins. But it says he will bless to a thousand generations. 
Now, I know some of you might not be math people, but a thousand, I think we all can realize, is a lot more than three or four. In fact, it is 250 to 333 times more. That's a lot more, isn't it? That's how merciful and full of grace God is. So when he warns us of these things, he's not being vindictive. He's like, oh, if you do this, watch out because I am really hurting your grandkids. He's just making a statement of fact, just the condition of the reality of a warning that our sin, the sins that came before us, the sins we do, they affect the family dynamics and the people that come after us. Think about it. The struggles you have, how many of them can we contribute to the same type of things? Maybe we came from our family of origin that our parents had and their parents before them. Sins of addiction passed down from generation to generation. Sins of adultery. Statistics tell us all kinds of sins are that way. The percentage of people that come from divorced homes, much more likely to get divorced. The people that come from alcoholic homes, much more likely to be alcoholics. Same thing with abuse, drug addiction, so many things the statistics show us. It's just a statement of reality that if we continue on those same patterns, those same things we've learned from the people before us, they affect us, passed down from generation to generation, unless something breaks that cycle. And God is able to break that cycle. God breaks cycles. He breaks the cycle of sin. He will do it in all of our lives. The Israelites saw this. They had done the same thing as their forefathers. They faced many of the same crises. How many times in your own life have you seen your parents and you think back and be like, man, I'd never do that. But how many times did you do the thing you said you were never going to do? Because these patterns are set up for us and we follow them. These same sinful patterns ingrained into us. I'm not saying we blame our parents or our grandparents. The important thing is not to blame. We're responsible for our own conduct, our own selves. But to understand that, yes, yeah, sin is often passed down. The consequences, the patterns that are set up, passed down from one family member to another. But God will break us and free us if we seek him because he is merciful and good. We don't have to stay in those same patterns. God will satisfy his justice, but he is always looking to be merciful. That's why he extends to us the opportunity that he himself will pay for the justice that is owed. We all do want justice to some way, right? If someone you loved was, say, murdered, Someone just came in, cold-blooded, shot them, because, hey, I just wanted to see what it was like to kill someone. And we'd say, oh, I don't, I don't like that. Rightly so. But what if they went to trial and the judge said, ah, just try harder not to do it next time. Be on your way. You'd say, that's not just. Kind of what we do to God, we sin against Him, we owe Him a sense of justice because of the thing that we've wronged against God. And yet, what does God do? He's like, oh, Jesus, I'll take the punishment. Someone has to be punished. Someone has to take the consequence. I'll do it on your behalf. That's how good God is. He's taken our consequences, our punishment. When we think of that, doesn't that fill us with gratitude? Don't our hearts just want to burst with appreciation? Don't we want to know more about this God who loved us so much that every punishment we deserve said, I'll suffer that. He's so merciful and so good. Now, sometimes we do live with on this earth the consequences of some of our sins. Of course, we do. There are consequences to things that we do, actions we take, sins that we bring into this world and that we see them, right? We do things. We lie. We get caught. There's a consequence. There's shame and guilt that we live in for the things that we've done before. But God is good. And He will forgive us. And when we know God, we accept the consequences of our sin. In fact, we say, yes, you're right. I sinned. I broke God's perfect law and commandment. I admit it. In fact, I, I'm willing to share it no matter what the shame is because God is good. He took it from me. 
I'm not good because I did this. But God took the consequences of that from me. He took my desire, my addiction, my problem because he's good. We need to though to think about God's justice. There's a, a movie that was made in 1948. I haven't seen the movie, but I've read the synopsis. Maybe some of you have. Maybe you can catch it on classic movies or something like that. It was called All My Sons. And in it, plot synopsis of it, from what I understand, a true story about a man named Joe Keller. He ran a manufacturing business during the Second World War. Uh, and he was making parts for planes, as was the custom everyone pretty much had to during the Second World War, work for the war effort. And there were some parts that were a little defective. Now well, they were a lot defective. And he had to make a choice. All these are going to be scrapped, in which case my business is going to go under. Or I just give them to the Air Force anyway. Joe decided that he was just going to give them to the Air Force and hope for the best. They went to the Air Force and eventually they led to the death of 21 people. They tracked it back to Joe's factory. These were defective when you sent them. Joe was able to uh, deny it. In fact, able to blame someone else. It was their fault in the process. Another employee caused this problem. That person was found guilty, sent away. So only Joe knew what he had done wrong. Uh, but eventually his son, Chris, kept looking into this and investigating. And uh, he realized it was actually his dad's fault. And he confronted his dad about it piecing together the evidence. And when he confronts his dad, there's a scene from what I understand that his dad said, who are you to judge me? Who is anyone to judge what I did? To which his wife chimed in and goes, maybe you should just admit what you did was wrong. And then Joe goes, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everything I did, everything I did, you want me to give up everything I worked for? Do you think that would bring back those 21 pilots? Should I have told the truth? What difference would that make? I did what I did for you and for our son, for our family. There's nothing higher than that. How can you sit there and judge me? And his wife looked at him and said, Joe, maybe there's something higher than family. Maybe there's something higher than your own motivations. And then Joe's son, shortly later, I think, in the film was able to find evidence that, in fact, because of what Joe had done, indirectly led to the death of their other son who had fought in the war. They knew he had died in the war, but they didn't know there was a connection <laughs> between what he had done with those parts and what led to his own son's death. You see, what he had thought he was doing, protecting his family, trying to secure their financial future, actually led to the death of his own son. And then he realized all these things he was trying to do, keeping his family intact, to provide a future for them, actually destroyed it because he did not do the thing that was right and at the end of the movie he concludes that he should turn himself in he goes up the steps and he's I think the last line it said from what I read of the movie was he said they were all my sons I guess to realize that there was a sense of justice to admit that what we had done is wrong we see we live in a fallen world and we're all going to choose at various times not to do the thing that is right people are not going to do the right thing towards us but God is just and we who know him must pursue him and must live to the best of our ability to do what is right and if we do what is wrong we apologize we confess we make right what we did that was wrong because the justice of God is important it's important to understand that justice and goodness they originate from God God alone is righteous he is the one that's fair and good he has given us a conscience that helps guide us. He has given us the Holy Spirit that also guides us, especially those who have accepted Christ that lives within us to help us know the things that we should do that are right. And God calls us to live in justice, to reflect the same qualities that, that He has done. What does the Bible say? So many times there are passages throughout the Old Testament and New, but I'm like to read just from the Old Testament. Sometimes we think, that God wasn't concerned in the Old Testament about suffering and things. But here's just a couple passages. Deuteronomy 15, 11. There will always be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy. Psalm 10, 17. You, Lord, hear the cries of those who are afflicted. You encourage them. You listen to those cries. We must defend the fatherless and the oppressed. Isaiah 117, 
Learn to do what is right, to seek justice, defend those who are oppressed, take up the cause of those who have no father, plead the case for the widow. Deuteronomy 10, 19. You are to love those who are foreigners because you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. James 5, 4. Look, the wage you've failed to pay the workers who mowed in your field cry out against you. The cries of the harvest now have reached the ears of God Almighty. God is concerned for justice. He's concerned how we live, how we interact with people, how we do the things that are right in this world. So much that it, from James again, chapter 1, 27, religion that God the Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. We live in an age in which some people say that there's a promotion of a social gospel. What a social gospel means is that you can be saved. The good news is by doing social things. You can't be saved from doing anything. It's only by the gift of God, of God's grace. But at the same time, God certainly expects us to live with social responsibility. He expects us to live the right way, to follow the things he has instructed us to do. And so we proclaim the good news that God has freed us from the consequences of our sin with our words, but we live for God and with his expectations of behavior in the conduct of our thoughts, our motives, and our behavior. And so really, our social responsibility and our proclaiming the gospel are really two sides of the same coin. How we speak and how we live are vastly important to God because they are reflective of God. Look at Jesus. He was always sharing and telling people about his father, about how they too could have a relationship with about the father, how they could find forgiveness of the things that they have done that was wrong. And yet at the same time, he sought out all those who had issues and hurt and problems, and he worked to make their physical, their emotional, their social, their financial well-being better. He went around doing good as he has called us to do. I think of the late Christian church leader, John Stott, who once observed, there was in Jesus a bond between evangelism and compassion and service. He was the action and love that he proclaimed. That's what we are called to do, action and love. To reflect that God is just, to tell the world that God is just, that he punishes sins, that I deserve punishment for my sins. Yes, I do. I have done wrong things and I confess and admit it. But God is merciful. And you, like me, may find mercy in him because he is good and compassionate and kind. It is why he, the church has started so many of the wonderful things that we so take for granted and so aren't even discussed in our society. Like we mentioned last week, the founding of hospitals. Largely, for the most part, an unheard of idea until Christianity propelled this idea. The idea of educating people, teaching them for free that they could read and write, do basic math, to eliminate things like slavery in the world. And yes, it was not exclusively that every Christian was against slavery, but it was true that it is almost exclusively that those who fought for the ending of slavery did so because of their Christian faith. That is almost exclusively true. You see, God says we find the world as it is. And then he asked us to make our world better. How do we make it better? Not just because we sure will it to do better, but because we know God. We know both his justice and how he satisfied his justice for us. And then we have experienced his mercy for us in our own lives. And then we want to share both his justice and his mercy with those who are around us. I think of the words of the prophet Micah in chapter 6 and verse 8, which read, The Lord has told you what is good, what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let us pray. Father God, you are the source of justice, but you are the giver of mercy. You are holy and good. So often we fall so short of your perfection. 
Help us to admit that we are not perfect, yet we may know you who is. Help us to get rid of any pretense of our own self-righteousness, but instead to repent from sin, admit it, turn from it, teach others the same way, freely admit our sin so that others too may understand that they too are sinners and that they have a safety net in seeking your mercy when we repent and turn towards you. Help us to join with you in what you are calling us to do and to become, that we would seek to know your justice and mercy and that we would share that in word and deed with the world who is around us. In Jesus' holy name, amen.